Hello, Joe. Hello, Shauna. Hey, Jerry, did you leave a message on my office machine? I yes, think yes. I did. I think when I called you back last night, when you called me oh. about the case, I think I, I wasn't paying attention and I think I ended up getting your office, but it. That's fine. I just want to make sure you didn't need anything. I always need something, Joe. <laughs> Donna, how'd you think that Waterbury meeting went? A plus. They that was quick. Cared. They couldn't have cared less. Yeah, there, there are a few people on their phones there. Just FYI. That's all right. Be the first. How many my people? Future, my future, my future daughter-in-law probably would be the first person that, that she was in the crowd. My my son's fiance. Oh really? So I said to her, "I go, you couldn't have been any more disinterested." <laughs> How many people ended up? It had to be seventy people. I mean, it was a place. There were a lot of people. Yeah. Wow. Mostly from where? Uh, there's about 10 law and there's a 10 of everybody really i mean the prosecutors are about six to eight and public defenders at the same three or four judge three judges i mean victim advocates family services had probably about all, all 14 of their staff so it was a pretty big crowd wow but it is what it is it's all good they had good questions though yeah they always do the law, law, law enforcement specifically, I mean, no matter what we do, it's like the first time they're hearing it and they get a little, a little upset. But we did a lot of work with Waterbury PD already and we did PD dispatchers. Um, so, yeah. On to Torrington. All you right. Date yet, right? Say that again, buddy? You didn't send us a date yet, right? For what? For Torrington. You said March. It's almost March. Hi, Mary. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Mary. I um I sent I met with the judges and I'm I'm gonna meet with family services and then you're up next. But I'm I have the New England Fathering Conference in March, so a, a week gets kind of kicked out. So I'm trying to think whether it should be before or after that. Probably after. Okay. So sometime in March. But there's only two advocates, right? I mean, it's not like we have a bunch, correct? Yeah. Two advocates. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, the other one's civil. Yeah. <clears throat> But she helps. I mean, she covers and helps out anyway. Yeah, so probably she'll be probably out. be there. It's fine. <laughs> I'm not sure how many people are going to be on this meeting. Uh, there's only seven people registered. <laughs> um, Kai had texted me, Representative Belton had texted me that she um, um, was not going to be able to make it. Something came up. Um, I think Judge Doyle, he emailed me, said he'll be here but he didn't know how long. Um, and then. Um, and it's session. We know there. It's probably, they're not making it. So. Yeah. So that's Senator Kissel. And then we had um, Johanna Canning from the public defender's office registered for this group. Um, and then Bill Anselmo. Okay. Um, and then I also talked to Gail Hardy um, about either her or somebody from the state's attorney's office would be helpful to have them on this as well. Cool. So I just wait a few more minutes and give people a chance to get in. And because if not, it's really me and Merrick could run this meeting in our, with our eyes closed. I mean, a lot of it is going to be just go. Oh, here's Judge Doyle. Yep. Speak for yourself, Joe. What's that? You, you <laughs> do some sleep. We'll call up Linda Semino and call her back in. Hi, Judge Doyle. Hey, how are you? Sorry for being late. What's up, oh, Your Honor? We were just talking about we. It was. It's going to be. It's normally a small group, anyways, that signed up. Um, but we had a couple people that are not able to make it, so we're really just waiting. I think for um, the public defenders, Johanna Canning, um, and um, Bill Selma. I I might be able to help with that year, even though I came late. Attorney Canning is in the middle of a double murder case. Hmm. Oh, still um, okay. So our, our our subcommittee doesn't mean anything to her. Come on, I Joe. guess not. She's a great multitasker and is very good, but I think she might be a little bit sidetracked. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know the our other meeting that we had. She said she had started one. I didn't know if the trial was over or it's not. It's still going. Trust me on that. So okay. um, 
I doubt she's going to make it, but uh, I can let her know anything. I, I apologize because not only did I come late, but I have to leave. I'm in the middle of a sexual assault case. So uh, I told the jury we'd have a little bit more of an extended lunch, but I'm going to have to get back too. All right. And then I had mentioned too, that I had spoke to Gail Hardy about um, moving forward. If somebody, either her or somebody from the state's attorney's office would be helpful for them to be on this subcommittee. And I think she had something scheduled with the presentation she was doing for judicial today. Who's that? Gail. Oh, Gail Hardy. For Black History Month, she said. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to this two o'clock at Central. She's oh. probably going to that. <laughs> Is this, is this being recorded or is this live streamed? Uh, this is going to be live streamed. I, but is yes, that recorded I, too? Kirsten, would, is it, it would be recorded too then, right? Uh, so I'm not recording uh, to our cloud, but I'm streaming it on our YouTube channel. Okay. Yep. So it's just, it's just streamed? Yes. Correct. Correct. Okay. That's fine. So we'll give people to like 140 to, to jump on in case they're running late and then we'll just begin? Yeah. I nominate Gail Hardy as, as co-chair since so she's not here. She's not on this committee yet. <laughs> Whoever her representative is. Although I'm going to tell her you said that. <laughs> Don't do that. I need her help for a GPS. I mean, the other idea, Jerry, that we might have, and, and I'm not sure if it is by motion or what have you, but there might be people who participated in the standard subcommittee before it got um, brought into this body that would want to um, continue and, and, and be part of it. I'm not sure that's even allowable. Um, yeah, I'm but. just thinking back on, on Megan's on the other subcommittee meeting. Um, she had talked about actually on the larger council, I think, but the representation would be somebody that's on the council um, identifying somebody to represent, but it would have to be from their agency. So I think that technically could screen out, but maybe we can make, we can ask the chairs for an exception. I mean, um, because so you're talking about providers, right? Yeah, no, I'm just saying that the people that have some historical, um, not only participation, but maybe some investment in, in this. I'm thinking maybe, maybe Steve Lanza as an example. Um, but originally, if and it will do a, we'll do a history lesson, I guess, at some point. But originally, this was not just supposed to be criminal court related. These standards were supposed to be in, like for DCF. And we, we had so many other people at the table. Um, I don't think it ever got to that point. Um, but remember, we had DCF was a prime participant, DEMAS, um, Board of Pardons Parole. Um, we had a bunch of different individuals um, around the table um, because I think it was supposed to be a kind of a statewide thing that if you're running any sort of DV program, and I think DCF runs D, uh, programming, parole might run programming, um, that it wasn't just um, the, the criminal court aspect, but um, and like, didn't they, I hear the chair say for the subcommittee memberships, it didn't have to be a council member that you could have to be a council member, but they could they could um, have somebody else, but it would have to be from the agency as well. Oh, I got you. I got you. So it had to be a council member's designee. Yeah, from yeah. their agency, not I like it could just okay. be. Okay. Right. I, I, I didn't understand it to be that way, but okay. Yeah, and, and frankly, I mean, I know I've I've talked to Steve Lons on limited on a limited basis over the years. He always asks what's going on with the council. I'd like to um, be part of it, but um, that's probably the only person that really was, you know, truly in, invested in 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 moving this along um, way more than others. Um, I mean, OBS 
I mean, we don't have anyone from OBS, although Mary is on the committee, so maybe someone from OBS. I could always ask Mary if she can, if she could have somebody else. Um, maybe for like Alka. Yeah. Um, and DOC, there used to be somebody from DOC, correct? Also. I thought there was somebody. Wait, yeah, there was, but it was, um, but they were, um, yeah, Department I, of Correction. I don't think they came to a lot of them, but. No, and, it, and it, that bounced around a lot. It went from yeah. different people to different people, but. But they they use programming, right? I believe so. Yeah, they have a DV program. Well, it's 141, Joe. Okay. Or wait. Judge Actually, Doyle. Uh, it's still, it's on you, Jer. I'm not on the council. Um, we'll call the meeting to, to order. Sean, I'll let you. Um, Do we have an agenda? Did everyone get an agenda? Yes. Did everyone? Yes. Yes. I nominate the honorable. No, I'm sorry, Judge. I would not even do that to you. Did you get one? No, I did. Oh, all right. Okay. Um, we'll call the meeting to order 141. Um, and we'll start with welcome and introductions. Um, and we'll start with um, Judge Doyle. Uh, my name is Kevin Doyle. It's an honor to be here. I'm sorry I was late and I think I've missed, miss, missed the first meeting too. I'm going to do my best to stay on this. I am on one other subcommittee and I just want to make sure I can give it the proper attention, but I look forward to work with anyone. Merrick? Hi, Merritt LaJoy, Office of the Victim Advocate. I think I know everybody here. Um, I was on the original um, subcommittee that uh, when we created the standards. So part of that history is in my brain, a little scrambled probably with all the other things in it, but um, <laughs> I'll do my best to help. Shauna? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Shauna Hall. I'm the Assistant Director of Criminal Legal Advocacy at CCADV. I'm fairly new to this role. I'm definitely new to this council. So I appreciate being here and looking forward to working with all of you. Joe? I'm Joe DeTuna. I'm the Director of Family Services, part of the Judicial Branch. Um, I was the former co-chair of the DV Standards um, Committee. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing the work in, in this uh, arena. Um, and I'm Gerilyn O'Neill Wild, Vice President of Operations at the Connecticut Coalition Against Domestic Violence. I, for a very short period of time, co-chaired um, the uh, previous council with Joe. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. The next piece on the agenda is selection of two chairpersons. Hello. Yes, Merritt. Um, first, I just wanna let everybody know that I have an intern with me. Her name is Valorin. I'm gonna step into the camera. Valorin, how are you? Valorin is from Central, so she's working with our agency. Um, she is going to be predominantly um, organizing with Vanessa National Crime Victims Rights Week, but she is also um, working with me for for the day. Yes. So she wanted to attend. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. And you I have to, choose... you have to dis dis discard any notes you take whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to make a motion to nominate Joe DeTuno and Shauna Harrington as our two co-chairs. Um, Joe has been doing this since I think when he um, turned 10, he took on this role. <laughs> and I know uh, Shauna being the new director of the uh, criminal legal advocates um, in the domestic violence arena will um, bring a, a wealth of knowledge to the role. So I nominate Joe and Shauna for our co-chairs. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thanks, Thanks Judge. That's what I'm here Thank for, you. Joe. You know, I'm always here to help. <laughs> You're the Dookie Hauser of this group. Come on. You guys do. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be pleased to do it. I think it's uh, it makes sense. And I look forward to working with Shauna. I think she's going to be a great addition to this. Although Jerry did great work um, and Karen Jarmock before her um, on this. Um, but I, I'm, it's a privilege to, to be a, a co chair. So I will turn it over to Joe and Shauna. So Shauna has all the information for this meeting. Um, so when there was going to be a, a robust uh, committee of people who were not really necessarily knowledgeable about our journey um, with DV standards, I was gonna give a fairly robust history um, of where we were and, and where we are today. Um, I don't really wanna bore 
uh, the Saks off of Merit, um, as she was our partner in this, um, and Jerry, who knows a lot about it. But I think just for the record, uh, I'll do a, a, a much briefer uh, historical account um, and really where we are today. Um, so, I mean, we've been doing this since 2012, 2013. Nancy Turner um, from CCADV uh, was tasked um, with this project, which is putting together uh, Connecticut offender standards. Um, and really, um, at the outset, it really was supposed to be very um, standardized for every domestic violence <laughs> intervention that's offered by any um, entity in the state. Uh, they would have to meet these standards. Um, a step before that, um, there was a prominent um, expert in domestic violence um, who came to Connecticut and during a presentation um, basically was um, asserting that Connecticut did not have any standards for their domestic violence programs. And um, despite um, our uh, loud objections, because the standards did exist within the contracts of the Judicial Branch Court Support Services Division, when you talk about Family Violence Ed, you talk about Explore and Evolve, there are standards that um, met or exceeded, especially with Explore and Evolve, um, ex, ex, you know, really just well went well beyond really what was in uh, standards and other batter intervention programs. Um, but when a national expert makes that assertion, um, things happen. And um, that really led to a public act. Um, it was, uh, it was 15 to 11, um, where, I mean, even before that, when we all got together and, and really sat down and, you know, Merritt did a great job. I remember uh, with Nancy uh, going through pretty much every state um, and they looked at all the batter intervention programs in every state and they picked um, those that were, um, that really were very quality and robust. And Nancy took all that information and compiled the initial uh, program standards. And um, I gave uh, the people that are on this program a copy of the, the, the standards um, that Nancy came up with that we brought into legislation and we um, modified in 2019 slightly. Um, but really what you have there is, is the basic foundation from which uh, we went uh, forward. Um, it took a lot of work. It took a lot of, a lot of meetings. And, and really, I think we came up with something that was really, um, I think special and something that I think that is um, still well above and beyond anything that exists in other states. Um, I think where some of the, the issues really came was not about building the standards, it was really how to apply them in practice. Um, I think for just understanding of criminal court cases, um, these standards are only, um, they only come into play um, for cases that are not referred to family services. And those would be, you know, the first time offenders, maybe the second time offenders. These, the standards really then become in play when family services says not referred and the case becomes um, within the domain of the state's attorney um, in terms of how that person wants those cases to be resolved. Um, that is one part of it. The second part of it is probation and parole. So that's post-conviction. Um, so the standards come into play post-conviction. Um, post-conviction, at least for probation, for CSSD probation, they have evolved, they have explore statewide and they have evolved in um, some areas of the, the larger dockets in the state. Um, explore and evolve follow standards, um, and as does the Family Violence Education Program, but to a lesser degree because it's shorter. Um, it's shorter in nature, and really the audience for, for the Family Violence Education Program is, is not the same as a batter intervention program. Um, these standards are built for longer term group, primarily interventions that historically would be referred to as a batter intervention programs. That's where Nancy took all the standards. Um, in other states, it's different than Connecticut. Connecticut has most of their DV interventions or most of the offenders that go through them um, are part of a contracted program network. 
at the judicial branch, where other states, um, it really is providers in the community have to reach out to an entity and say, I want to be on a, an approved list so that offenders can be referred to an agency. I don't believe there's any money that transpires that. So we, they don't contract with an agency. They just say, you have to agree that your program in Massachusetts, California, wherever it is, you are going to, when you work with the offender, follow these standards and criteria. Um, and that is how the court knows that the intervention is robust and matches the need of that offender. Um, so that, that's, that's part of it, right? It's not every domestic violence case. Um, and so the, the committee over the years thought that um, we had a very much of a build it and they will come kind of paradigm, which is if we built an approved provider list and we allowed uh, agencies or individuals to apply, um, then, they, then this would build itself and it would be robust. Uh, what we learned very quickly um, is that that just wasn't the case. Um, and we, we struggled, I think, as a group um, historically uh, on that, um, that we, I think, all assumed that um, there would be many, many agencies that would sign up and um, it would be cut, the state would be covered uh, by the agencies on the standards. Um, I think that, and Merit, I hope, will agree, is that and I'm not sure if Jerry was on the committee or not, but we did. I mean, it was a public relations campaign. I mean, I think we did it through uh, Dave Rentler sent to the a APA or uh, there was some major psychological association that Dave um, sent our flyer to. Um, and we did a lot of outreach. And uh, the reality is, is that it just didn't come to fruition. And um, I personally argued um, to no avail at times. Um, that it should be the defendant's responsibility um, to find a provider if that is the deal, right? If that's a deal from a prosecutor or their attorney wants them to get treatment, it's really up to them to engage in with a professional, show them what they need, which is they need to have a robust intervention that is covered by the standards. And then that professional should write back at the conclusion of that uh, participation or that intervention that yes, the standards were followed and yes, the defendant completed. Um, that was never um, agreed to. And um, I think the, the, the way we tried to solve it uh, was um, we had some federal grant money and we asked for an independent evaluation of how the standards were applied. And um, I think we all knew kind of what the outcome of that was going to be, even though um, I think it was important to have an external person do the work. Um, th that evaluation had some data components to it, but also had um, some focus groups and um, I think they call it focus groups, but they had different groups of people that talked about standards and how it was implemented in the court. Um, the findings I think were really illuminating um, for that, uh, that report that was done by Central Connecticut in that when he looked at the data, the low risk offenders got the family violence education program and that is really what they needed. That was the right intervention. Prosecutors did a great job with those. And he didn't use the word no brainers, but I think the really high risk people with the high level charges, those cases are, are pretty much addressed in, the, in, in a way that I think, because they ended up on probation most likely um, and would have gotten involved or explore, um, but there have been some level of intervention intensity that would match the, the high risk repeat offender who has a very serious charge. Where I think the, the gap in the system was the person who has, is a repeat offender, but the level of charge is low. And, and those are the cases where I think the, the system struggles with um, because it is how do you um, put a long-term program and the standards really are for 26 week program or something of that ilk. And it really isn't for a shorter duration program or an individual uh, intervention that has some intensity to it. Um, how do you get that as the outcome when the charge 
is lower and the reality is the prosecutor's analysis legally of the case is that there were not going to trial and at some point the case was going to be disposed without a conviction. Um, so those were, I think, the challenges. I think that that was really the outcome. Um, Karen Jarmok, who was the was the C CEO or the executive director of, of CCADV at the time, and I presented this information to CJ Pack. Um, our subcommittee was under CJ Pack all the way up until um, this this new uh, legislative body. But and I don't really know what CJ Pack stands for, so I'm not even going to try. Um, but it's criminal justice something. Um, and we, we did a presentation and, um, I think that the, 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 the subcommittee, I think was really going to then really determine kind of what we were going to do. And then Karen left. Um, so I think at that point, Karen left and then we had COVID, which obviously was a, was a challenge just to, to do anything in those, in those years. Um, so I think that the idea of how are we going to implement the standards still is a question that I think this subcommittee will probably need to um, address in earnest as we move forward. Um, I hope that it becomes uh, a defendant uh, initiated situation uh, and less so uh, a provider list. Although th once the person signs that, you know, they, they're doing this um, uh, intervention by standards, I think that we would hope that they would sign up. Um, one of the things I think that hasn't been really um, emphasized is really who is, besides the individual counselors, right? The individual therapists, who I think we all know, they're mainly on that. But who in the community um, is doing batter intervention, pro group batter intervention programs um, that isn't part of the CSSD network? Um, and I know at, at some point, um, Charles, um, I'm forgetting his name, Charles Frazier was doing um, some similar groups. I'm not sure if he does that anymore. Um, I don't think he put in for our standards. Um, and I, I just don't know what's out there right now that is a, a fee for service kind of situation. Um, but anyway, um, so when COVID started to um, lessen and we had a little bit more time to focus, um, I had a family relations counselor who was assigned to central office and part of her responsibility was something that I think was very important because there was somewhat of a, a lack of movement on the implementation front. Um, and we thought that, Hey, it's been 10 years. Let's see how we're doing in comparison to other States. Um, because one of the things we didn't want to see happen is that, the standards that we came up with in 2013, 10 years later, or nine or eight years later, are, are we still at or above what the other states are kind of doing in terms of state standards? So one of the things I had the Family Relations Counselor do um, was basically to almost replicate what Nancy did, which is go through and find out what the states are doing for DV standards and let us kind of know. Let us know how Connecticut compared. And then really, uh, for lack of a better word, um, steal all the things that we could probably utilize that were enhancements um, that we didn't think about. Um, and uh, the person did a really nice job of cutting the, the, the country in, in sections, um, identifying some of the better uh, DV standards that were out there, and then ultimately uh, presented to the subcommittee um, some of the things that she found, I think the biggest and probably the most important um, finding um, of her search was that, you know, Connecticut still is at or above anything that is out there in terms of standards. I think some of the areas where others, um, especially those that have, that have built standards after ours, I think they, they focus more on cultural competence um, and responsiveness um, and, um, I think that was kind of her main kind of as she went down the road. I think that is where, where she took a lot of. Um, she also went down the idea of same sex um, uh, battering and, and kind of what is out there relative to that. Um, I think she did a really nice job um, trying to figure out what the standards were for that. And she presented that information to our subcommittee and um, 
I asked her if she'd be willing to um, take a crack at taking what she came up with and just re basically redoing the standards. And that it was an extremely heavy lift for someone who wasn't really, you know, in tune with how to really change standards. Um, so she struggled a bit um, and then um, she left. Um, she came up with a, an actual uh, document. Um, but as time went on, I became less and less comfortable with just the idea of, hey, she came up with this stuff. I'm sure that she did a good job and now I'm just gonna hand it off to a, a, a subcommittee. Um, I, I didn't really feel comfortable with that. Not that I had any doubt, but I didn't think it would be wise to just, um, and I didn't have anyone to bounce it off of. She got to the point where we were going to meet and she was going to explain like in earnest, like this is all the things that I changed. And um, when she left somewhat abruptly, I never really had the opportunity to do that. Um, so I'm having another family relations counselor um, look at the old standards and what the, um, the other family relations counselor did in terms of, of changes and try to, first of all, see where those changes were. And then secondarily, did they connect to the PowerPoint that she gave to the subcommittee? Um, so again, that's just another pretty huge task um, of, of having a counselor do it. So I don't think I'm at any point right now where I wanna present anyone with these um, changes because um, I really want the new person to kind of get up to speed and then present to me kind of what the first counselor was um, what her goals were and whether it made sense where she put it in the um, in the in the chapters of the um, standards. Um, I'd be less comfortable if the the kind of the drum roll of the her work was that we were behind or fell or falling short in standards, but that really isn't really what uh, she uncovered at all. In fact, we're still leading uh, many of the states, and frankly, a lot of states don't even have state standards. They say they do, but you can't find them anywhere. It just says we will have standards and that's where we are. Um, so in terms of the work that we've done, I think that um, I, I'm very ready to explain to all of you what changes again that Natasha uh, um, kind of came up with, because that's just a PowerPoint that I can read. Um, and, and But again, I don't want to bore Merit um, if She's already done, she's already, you know, it's, it was like a two hour meeting, if you remember. I mean, she really went to some depth and detail. Um, I don't wanna bore people with that um, if it's not going to be fruitful. I'd much rather wait for the Wanda Huertas who's doing this now to really, you know, sink her teeth into um, what, actually, what Natasha actually did and to see what the comparisons were um, and then ultimately, the other thing that we, I never really got to is to make sure that we don't set up a standard that is not achievable um, for, for the people that we have in the community. Because you'd hate to have, even though we don't have many people signing up now, but in the, in the long term, if there's a different way to implement the standards, we don't want someone to say, I can't do that, right, for whatever reason. Um, so I, I really want to make sure that through that lens, um, I, I feel comfortable before we, we publish, um, formally publish. Now, I have no problem sharing um, the drafts uh, with this committee before, uh, but in terms of something formal. Um, so I'd love at least Merritt and, and Shauna and, and just to take a look and Jerry to see, okay, um, it, it, what, is she, what was she trying to accomplish and um, does it make sense? She always came to me. We, we met very frequently and she told me, theoretically and philosophically what she was doing, but I never got to the point where I, I was able to read with her kind of what she was doing. And I don't have her as a resource to go back and say, you know, what did you do? And, and what were you thinking when you did that? So that is a very long winded um, way of, of kind of taking 13 or 14 years and encapsulating kind of where we are. But I think I hit the salient points. Jerry, did you have a question? I think Merritt does. Merritt, what, is that, was that the history before Jerry? Was that, the, was that the history? Yes, it was the history. You did a good job, Joe. And I and I agree with you that, Natasha, most of the changes that were uh, presented to us were uh, regarding cultural competence and LGBTQ issues. And I think 
you know, not surprising, um, the feedback was there's nothing around the country specific to those populations um, for better intervention programs. So it's not that just Connecticut doesn't have them, they don't exist. And even if Connecticut had them, I think we'd have an issue of filling a class. And I think we've talked about that mm -hmm. um, because although, you know, we do see those kind of cases, domestic violence among those relationships, um, we don't see enough of them to be able to fill a class. And that was the other concern is that they have somewhere to go that meet the standards but it's not gonna be in a group format because there's just not enough cases. And, and I think the other worry was the people in the community that were doing individual work are, weren't sophisticated enough to deal with dynamics they're not familiar with or, or competent to, to address. Um, exactly. And, and that's really where I think that a lot of um, what she was trying to do was to be able to identify some individual practitioners that had a caseload of, you know, moderate to high risk DV offenders, male, female, whatever it is, but to make sure that they understand these are the criteria that you need to meet, including the training, which is a big part of the, the standards too, is how are you, um, how are you an expert in this, um, in any uh, work with offenders just in general, but anyone that has, um, that isn't in a group format, that might be um, an area of expertise um, that you might need to have to be successful. Um, and I know we've struggled this with the female population because yeah. the standards we developed are for men that batter women. And we say that right up front in the standards. So, And I think Natasha tried to weave in female offending in a way that was, um, it was identified, but it wasn't mandatory. I think mm -hmm. it was just kind of like, where it's in the standards, but it's not like, this was written for a, a male batter intervention program, without a doubt. And and um, and I think we struggled with that historically. And I think a lot of it was that if you put things in standard, then it shall happen in practice. And I don't think anyone was was prepared uh, because we tried and tried to to do something on that front. Um, but again, you know, I think that as if you remember, we shifted from in agencies to individuals, really for this purpose. Yeah. Um, because even if you have a, a, a group form that's only a couple of, of people, because right. um, we struggle with how many people should be in the group and um, all those other other things that are, are a little bit challenging, so. Yeah, yeah. And we, right, didn't, yeah. we never voted on the changes, so you're right, that was just left up in the air. Yeah, I mean, because Karen, I think, left pretty quickly thereafter, and right, I think right. it was like a pretty big void and we really didn't have. No, um, we didn't have time. And I think I just by, that. And I think I just said to Natasha, just, are you willing to, to tackle that, mm. you know, taking what your take your theory and build it into a, a standard um, where you can't really steal word for word. <laughs> it, right. it was, it was hard for her, honestly, yeah. she did a really nice job. Um, she tried really hard, but it, it was, I know Nancy struggled with, with pulling this together, it took her years to do it. So yeah. You know. Yeah. Jerry, what question might you have? As a co-chair, I can deny that question, right? Yeah. It, it was the answer, Joe. <laughs> I'll let you off the hook. So that, that's kind of where we are. And, and I think that um, for this subcommittee, I think um, that finishing the standards is, is important. Um, but the reality is I might come back and say, hey, listen, here's the deal. Um, it, it fell flat, right? It just, whatever, you know, I, I just don't have that person anymore. To, to make corrections to the, the, what she did, she's gone, right? So what she pr produced, I don't know, I can't go and call her up and say, hey, on page five, you talked about this. Um, so some of the changes might just not be able to be replicated, I guess, for, for lack of a better word. Um, that doesn't mean that the work about what she identified uh, and the time she spent identifying what was best practice in other states isn't something that we have to deal with. It might not be as um, ready-made as here's a new set of standards and we just have to vote on it. We might have to do some some work on them um, to get them up to speed. I hope not. I mean, w Wanda's really doing a deep dive in, the, in, in trying to figure out um, what the changes were and if they're connected to her PowerPoint. And that's kind of where we are. Hey, Jill, I have a question. 
I hope I can articulate this clearly. Um, we recently met with, and when I say we, Judge Gold, Judge Damiani, um, Judge Wu, few of the judges that do domestic violence, um, there was a focus group, and they were doing kind of an overview, I assume, of Connecticut's practices. I remember meeting with a retired judge from Michigan who was very well known in domestic violence and a, a sitting judge from the state of Washington. And they kind of interviewed us about kind of how judicial handles things and some of the programs and things we have. Has that report been completed? Is that something that we're going to see or what happened with that? Oh, is that Jerry's people or is that somebody else? I don't remember that judge. That actually, yes, um, Your Honor, we're still working with the Center for Justice. Sarah, can you stop with the Your Honor until we're in court? Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you probably have enough free time to go to law school and get a law degree, but geez, go Sorry. ahead. Sorry. Um, so that was a project that CCADV had started before yep. this, the larger council came to fruition, I guess I'll say. Um, so we had engaged with the Center for Justice Innovation to do some work to kind of get an idea of the state of the state. Um, and then as this, the statute, I mean, the, um, Bill was introduced to start the larger council. We decided to continue with it in hopes that we would have a product to be able to provide to this council as we're moving forward with our work. So there have been uh, focus groups that have been facilitated out in um, the New London, well, I guess I should say the Eastern part of the state. Um, and then we just did another round in the Western and Southern part. Um, we we're gonna be, I think, offering one more round of focus groups because we were doing the focus groups with all the various stakeholders involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and then I, we just uh, started to um, finalize our contract with somebody that's gonna be writing that report. Um, but again, we will have that and it will be submitted to the, um, the larger council. And again, it's kind of a baseline of where the state is. Um, and I know, and I appreciate that the judges participated in, in a focus group too. Um, because that information I think is gonna be very helpful. Um, but again, we'll, we're hoping to have that, um, but I don't have a timeline for it right now. No, no, that's, yeah, I, I just wanted to see, cause I was thinking it might be related to some of the issues that are gonna come up in this group and it might be something good to look at. Cause I remember at the time hearing it was gonna be pretty vast. And I mean, we spent, I think upwards of two hours. They had a lot of questions. They were very knowledgeable, um, you know, so I'd be interested in just seeing where that was at. I can update as we move forward, but hopefully we will have something, uh, like I said, one more round of uh, focus groups. And then um, we just wanted to have some increased participation from a couple different stakeholder areas. Um, what, are, what are they looking at when you say um, an evaluation of Connecticut? Evaluation um, of what? Well, it was an evaluation of kind of like the, the system where we are right now. So I don't have the questions in front of me. I can certainly connect with you, Merit, to kind of the questions that were asked for the focus groups. Um, but it was really looking at where are we right now and how, where are there opportunities to strengthen the response? Where are there challenges? Um, we invited uh, public defenders, uh, prosecutors, family relations, uh, judges participated, and our family violence victim advocates. We also opened it up to include some offender program providers. Um, so we did get some minimal feedback there. Um, but I probably will connect with Joe for the next round of focus groups to see if there's opportunity to get more feedback. And part of that is too, right? COVID really impacted how things are being handled across the yeah. state. And when we constantly talk about, you know, uniformity, there were some great things that happened during COVID. Um, but then there was some other things that were not so great that have continued. And we want to get an idea of where things yeah. are and where can we strengthen the response. And I think we can also, um, I think the committee could also benefit from some numbers. Joe, if you can bring numbers together. Sure. Um, number, because I remember when we started the standards, it was this $10,000, I mean, 10,000 number of cases yeah. that that we thought was about yeah. right, that we're going through, that we were concerned about. So if we can, yeah. and find out where the programs are being utilized as well, I think that would be helpful. Um, One of the things Natasha did do is update the, the list of the standards um, at the standards, the agencies that are on our our website. Um, but in terms of judicial branch programs, I mean, Explore is in every GA and Evolve is in five. It's, it just went to bid. So right. is that what you're talking about? 
Yeah. Just yeah. Overview of programs. Yes. Yeah, because I heard um, I heard recently that New London wasn't utilizing enough, so it's been taken out of New London as of June first or something. And it went and it's being shifted to Hartford. Right. So that I mean, and, that's I mean, it's really it's a it's a use issue. I mean, we don't want a program not being utilized. Um, right. But um, yeah, that that was a decision that was made by our grants and contracts, um, not. Me, so I don't really. It, it's they did. They do focus groups um, for the, the the RFPs, which is how we contract with the providers. Um, so that was a decision that was made based on low utilization, or utilization basically from probation rather than the court, which I think you know evolve and evolve specifically is really more of a you know court connected uh, program. But they weren't using it, so. And I just want to mention too, when you mentioned the updated list, Joe, too, I, I think even during COVID, we, we did get a couple more providers on the list, but still yeah. there's not providers that are statewide um, on that list. Um, and, and, and nor do I anticipate that ever happening. Right. Which, right. Is the, which I think is the, the, the challenge of um, how, how, do you, how do you do it? Um, and, you know, I think we, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about other alternatives, and I think that um, my prior co-chair was was saying that if you know there's there's rules that they can't enter a notley without TV standards, and you know that if they follow the rules, there would be more people on the list, um, and um, that just never happened. Right. So the other, I mean, the other challenge that we always have with numbers, Merit, is that you know a lot of what we're talking about are plea bargains between a prosecutor and a public defender or defense attorney or self-represented litigant that isn't spelled out anywhere. Um, and I, I don't know if the prosecutor's data uh, abilities or capabilities have, have improved since we did this battle back, you know, five years or more now. Um, but really, it, it really is, a, it's a case by case analysis by the prosecutor um, and you know, how would we ever get that information? And I think that's really where we struggle too, is that as many of the state's attorney's representatives on the committee would say, you know, we're doing a legal analysis of whether we're taking a case to trial and dot, dot, dot. And wh what does that mean in terms of, well, um, the finishing of a program wouldn't make it different. Um, and, and right, cause there, I mean, I, we had a lot of conversations with People that said, listen, if I'm going to nolly a case, I'm going to nolly because I can't bring it to trial. Not because, and we had heard a bunch about earn nollies, right? But that really probably was more for the first time offenders. I'm not sure what a prosecutor, and that's why it's so important to have a prosecutor as part of this process. Um, but I don't know. I always thought it would make sense to do it the other the other way. Um, that if a, the 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 end result is that if the person doesn't complete treatment, it, like the cap system that um, you know we've we've heard a lot about, the prosecutor saying if you finish a program, then you'll get a, a lighter sentence. If you don't, then you get a heavier sentence for being as simplistic as possible with it. Those are the situations where I think then you're talking like a vow, or you're talking about something that's going to be on a docket for quite a bit of period of time, um, but not just you know, hey. I'm a public defender. I'm a lawyer. Go, go, go to counseling. You know, I'm not sure that that necessarily earned that person a, a, a disposition of a nolly. I just don't know the answer. Right. And it, it almost have to have the analysis of cases to understand which fell into which bucket. Um, and I, I don't think we ever got to that point. Well, and that's what we were trying to avoid was somebody going to their pastor or something like that, that was not addressing right. the needs, you know, of a batterer that needed treatment. Right. But I think that that issue, again, some of the prosecutors historically have said it, but that would never, I would never have that be the the outcome on a pretrial basis, right? It would be more like, I'm not moving forward with this. At some point it's getting nollied. Um, we're just waiting to see if the person follows the protective order and treatment or batter intervention was never a prerequisite for a disposition. Um, and that's that's the difference from CAP, right? Which is you're, you have a choice of finish this program or you're gonna be sentenced to some period of incarceration versus, okay, you finished, now you'll go on probation. 
you know, which is the, the cap model that Kevin Dunn put forth many years. And that's why Evolve existed, right? So Evolve was the cap, right? If you did Evolve, then you might not go to jail. If you go to jail, you might not go for as long. If you finish Evolve and you're, you do well for that almost a year, then you might get a, 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 a different di disposition. Um, with the research from Dr. Cox, it was that those cases are the ones that they get right. The ones they struggle with are the, the person who should be potentially held accountable because they've been arrested multiple times, but the charge is a disorderly conduct or there's weakness in the legal case and they're going to, they're going to nolly it anyway. I don't know. And Joe, is that the 10,000? That's the 10,000 that Merritt was talking about. I think the 10,000 is the, is the spectrum of what we're talking about. There are some people who are going to have to do intervention and show the prosecutor that they're, they're making steps to, to, correct behavior and then they'll, their case will be disposed what that is it could be a conditional discharge or something maybe probation but there's also that other subset of cases where no matter what they're never going to do a, a 26 week program uh, for a disorderly conduct charge that they they aren't going to put the trial so that that's the that's the rub right there's the, it's all those cases and we just don't have any data about what that analysis is yeah. Right. Then, Other than an individual prosecutor um, coming and saying, "This is what I do in New Haven or Bridgeport," or "This is this is how I analyze cases." Um, but for us, I mean, I think that if you look at cases that you would think are going to conviction, right? I mean, so the end of that, so the end of that court case is going to either be a guilty plea or not, right? Or some sort of a a sentence, right? Whatever that is, you would want that to be part of a bat, a pretty significant batter intervention program, right? I mean, if we're looking at trying to compartmentalize some of this and make it make sense, is that we would want the high risk people with serious charges. Those individuals should, without a doubt, have some sort of a batter intervention program component to it. At least we know that those cases are being addressed appropriately in the in the big picture. Um, we don't want someone that is high risk and has really high charges to end up with a nolly, right? Ultimately. Um, yeah. And, and like when, when I started in Bridgeport in 2014, I guess it was, you know, I had the benefit of working with Kevin Dunn and, you know, then Stephanie Damiani and the crew that they had there. They had experienced prosecutors and public defenders. And we were definitely, and I saw firsthand it was more effective to do the evolve explore program while the case was between like Joe said, it entered a plea and before sentencing, because then the judge had the most leeway and there was the most oversight as opposed to doing it on probation where they've served some jail time or they they're done with that. And now they're just dealing with a probation officer. I felt that, having the judge directly involved under the threat of the cap got them more kind of focused on doing the input. And I can remember we did a presentation with, um, I believe it's Dr. Derek Gordon. Joe, help me out, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. right. Great guy who oversees the Explore and Evolve groups. And I remember he said something to me that stuck with me was, you know, we were provided um, with the crim track system, which gives us a list of all our dockets and the people that are on it. And we have the ability in our laptop to enter notes to follow the case. So when I was doing the DV cases in Bridgeport on crim track, I kept the notes of what was required because we would explain it when they entered a plea, everything they had to do. What's the worst case scenario? What's the best case scenario? And we would instruct the judges to explain that you not only have to complete the avowal, but you have to actively participate and successfully graduate. And that if you get removed for noncompliance or if you become a disturbance, you are in violation and you're looking at the maximum sentence because you violated the agreement. And what Derek, Dr. Gordon told me that he saw a big change was the more that the judges and there was oversight where the judges would, and I tried to look when they, I got a good report because we would get periodic reports every month. They had a good report. I would give them the kind of good job. You know, that's what you need to do. 
If they had the bad report, it might be an initial warning because they're coming late. If it was more significant, it would be, you know, maybe take them into custody, a cooling off period, either restart or get in or just go right to sentencing. And what Dr. Gordon said to me that I remember was what he saw was as it was more involved and we, the judges, were more involved, the group members were starting to police each other. And literally, you know, someone would say, hey, you know, if you start acting up, you got to go back to the judge. And I've been to that judge and, you know, she's not going to let you slide. So it it does work. And I think for the more serious cases, we always made sure we get within the context of between plea and the final sentencing. So they had the most exposure and the most kind of I guess the phrase is kind of skin in the game. You know what I mean? And we always made sure because there there could be issues with substance abuse or mental health. We did that treatment first and we would explain to them, we don't want you saying, you know, you can't sh show up to these groups if you're still struggling with substance abuse. It's not an excuse for your behavior, but it's clearly going to impact your ability to complete the program. And so we dealt with that first. And I saw, you know, firsthand that that approach generally worked well, you know, for the more serious cases. But for me, it always kind of judge, it always kind of reverts back to a prosecutor's analysis of the situation and what they're offering and those types of things. And that really is the information that we really struggle to 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 kind of get on a on a it is and it's hard, right? Because you know, char what 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 kind of runs the show? Is it charge? Is it prior history? Is it a combination of both? Is it the strength of the case? Um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with prosecutors over the years. And they would say, like, we identify the cases that that we think that this needs to happen in. And in the ones that we don't, you know, it's just not going to be part of the, the discussions or it'll be on a trial list. So I don't, I don't know. And that, that's always been the confounding variable here of, you know, how do we make sure that the standards are applied um, appropriately and um and how do we know that they're applied appropriately? And I think that's really what goes to, to Merritt's point is, you know, how do, how do we know, right? I mean, where's the information that says this was a situation where, you know, the, the case needs to have a robust intervention that meets the standards. And the other is legally it's insufficient. I don't have enough to go to trial, so I'm not going to proceed. I don't think that those cases um, are going to ever have, have a 26 or a lengthier domestic violence program because there's a, a legal part of it too, that so there's two lawyers dealing with that issue. Um, so I guess the the idea for me is to kind of not look at the, the whole continuum of situations because it always is going to be a, a discretionary analysis and then look at the cases that should have had the standards uh, applied and for whatever reason didn't. And what what's the reason for that? Yeah, and let me, I have to leave shortly, but I guess yeah. I'll leave on one other confounding variable to Joe, okay, that I just want people to think about because part of why we're having these groups is to kind of have open and frank discussions of everything, you know, and try to come to the best results. Um, I do think there's an issue now just to be aware of is there is a lot less senior experienced people in the state system, Okay. Um, and I'm just going to give us, you know, a specific yep. example. All the people that I started with as prosecutors in Bridgeport and a lot of the experienced public defenders that work this docket are no longer there. You know, right. the Kevin Dunn, Stephanie Damiani, Judy, uh, and of course I'm blanking our last name, Judy Stevens, um, some of the more experienced public defenders. There's been, you know, the, the retirements and a lot of things that I think we have to be aware of when we talk about standards and talk about putting stuff together that that is another confounding variable um, that we have to take into account and be cognizant of because it is an issue across the board. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's it's tough to replace when you lose that much talent uh, and then try to hold them to the same standard. So I just throw that out there. I don't mean to leave on a negative note, but. Um, with that, I'm going to sign off now. I'm sorry that I have to leave. If there's anything else you need, let me know, and uh, we'll go from there, okay? Thank okay. you. I appreciate it. Hey, Judge. You Thanks, judge. guys. Sorry about that. Have a good day. You too. And I think that's a, um, a really good segue, if I can bring something up. I mean, I, I'm a little... Um, 
on what you were talking about, Joe, before, you know, I've had conversations with Jerry and Shauna and, um, you know, what we're seeing, what I'm seeing is the explore or evolve being used pre-trial. And I hear what you're saying about um, the state struggling with their case. They're not going to prosecute this. So what are we going to do with this guy? You know, he's got a history. He's already taken, you know, FEEP and da, 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 da. But I don't think, and, and this is going to be another issue that the committee is going to have to struggle with then. You know, those were conviction-based programs, right? Um, Bridgeport, I agree. You got this, this cap. That's what Kevin Dunn used to call it. Mm -hmm. um, it was good. It did hold their feet to the fire. And he... But, but they were pleading to something. Right. Um, it was these conditional pleas that Kevin was doing with the cap, yeah. as you were saying. And there was a conviction. You take that conviction away. And even in these cases where the state is going to have a hard time prosecuting the case, I have an issue with us using these programs in that way. Um, I'd like to hear, and, and also, in addition to that, and I think this is what the judge was saying, and maybe that's why this is happening, DV dockets are disappearing. So yeah. I think we have to struggle first with, we are a state that takes domestic violence seriously. We have said that over and over and over again. We just created this council for this council that to then tackle these tough issues. Jerry, you're right. We went through a whole bit of stuff with COVID, some of it good, some of it bad. It's brought our it's brought our systems to a new level, right? With video and all that stuff. However, it also dismantled domestic violence dockets. Maybe it's a staffing issue among prosecutors and judges. I don't know. But stepping away from domestic violence dockets when we know they work um, is part of the problem. If we're not, if we're going to say we're a state that is going to combat domestic violence, then we're going to do it. We're not going to talk about it because what we're doing is the opposite of what we're saying. And again, I'm not sure. is this this subway is intact on DV dockets though? That's a no, no, no. It's not. I'm ju I'm just saying the bigger picture here yeah. is you know. Right. We're and, saying we're going to have these standards, and they're so tough, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. But on the other end, we're talking out both sides of our mouth. We're dismantling dockets, and we're we're giving explore and evolve to non-convicted people. We're not taking it as serious, so we can well, say, well, well, yeah, well, it's really. I think it always just comes back to how a prosecutor uses a tool. Right. I mean, evolve is always was always available on pretrial, but it you know it was post conviction, right? So it and explore because evolve isn't in every court. Some places used in the history of it. Um, I'm I'm not using I'm not overseeing it anymore. But they would use it similarly to evolve with mm -hmm. the cap structure. That's right. all they had, right? So um, I'm not sure that a whole bunch of people are using. There are not many people use evolve and explore just in general, um, I mean, I think that is probably not as robustly used as you would think. And that's why I think seeing numbers would help Joe. Yeah, no, 100%. Because what, yeah. what I'm getting from victims and everything, you mm -hmm. know, they're calling me and they're telling me this stuff. I'm going, this does not make any sense to me. And now I'm following up, they're that's absolutely amazing. right. And I'm saying, this is not what this is for. So and there's I, a I disconnect think, yeah. there. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, and I think that we, Obviously, as a group, we've struggled with this, right? I mean, Karen took a very hard line of if prosecutors did what they were supposed to do, there'd be a robust list, there'd be, you know, standards in every case. And we just know that that isn't reality. We, we, we ran into that brick wall a hundred times mm -hmm. in, in relative to what's the outcome. Well, how do we get around that in terms of the standards um, and how we apply them? Um, Steve Cox did a nice job of really, I mean, that report is really kind of illuminating of what the problem is. I think that we really need to figure out what does a prosecutor go through in terms of their analysis of a case and when would they 
to use a program that is not just just do something, right? They really want the offender to do some program. Um, what what cases did, does it look like? Because we know we're not getting the data from the state's attorney, right? We would never get a, a dump, a data dump that would say 40% of cases with an offender that had did already did FEP and it, it had its charge that was a felony. This is what happened. I don't think they can do that analysis. Um, I know Steve Cox tried to do it, but he didn't have access to prosecutor files, um, which I think would be very illuminating in terms of, of a lot of this situation. Um, I, I think, and that's really why I think I went down the road of just revamping the standards is because we were at any place that we could kind of make any sort of headway. Yeah. I mean, we just okay. sat there and we're like, okay, now what do we do? You know, because now that we're going to do court watching and remember the, all that kind of thing that yeah. Karen was saying is like, but even if you court watch the state enters an alley, what are you going to do? I mean, you don't, you can't run up and say, can I see your file real quick? You know? Um, but I think we always wanted the data. Yeah. So, I mean, for yeah. us, I think that we know that the actual provider list is a bust. That, that, that isn't, that's never worked and it, it, it's, it's not going to work. Um, either there's no one in the community doing the work anymore um, in terms of group, right? I mean, individual is individual, but I'm saying like groups, like I, can I go to the YMCA or not the YMCA? Uh, Catholic charities and say, I need a DV group. And they'll say, oh, on Tuesday night, we have a DV group. I don't know if those exist in any communities. I, I just don't. Um, but I also think that, in, that an offender who is told to get treatment should go to get treatment at a place that knows what they're doing and has a program that is not three sessions and you're done. Um, so. Right. Well, and, and that's why when we talk about a prosecutor, we need to know what a prosecutor, their analysis is. I mean, that is an argument for DV doc. It's all on its own. Because if you have a prosecutor that understands domestic violence, they're going to know the tools. They're going to use the tools they have, you know. But, you know, if we're just going to get rid of these dockets and let every prosecutor handle domestic violence, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. And if anybody slaps themselves on the forehead and says, oh, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. And they're I mean, a moron. Yeah, you know, I remember, I mean, as I oversaw the programs, it really took a, a person like a Kevin Dunn. And I can't remember the, the guy's name in New Haven. I'm sorry. It's Mark Remia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, when we had like the, the, the cream of the crop. And then, you know, as they went to other places, if you don't have that level of expertise and that level of uh, the system working together, um, you know, it, it ended up there. I'm not going to name the court, but I, I remember the, the, the prosecutor that was assigned was just new, brand new. And, and, you know, I, that was a struggle. I mean, they ultimately moved to someone else, but you know, a lot of that stuff is outside of our control, even if we did build something like that. Right. I yeah. Mean, and this is what I'm saying. You know, I mean, do we care about domestic violence or don't we? Because if we did, those prosecutors would be getting training, <laughs> just like, you know, I mean, I know they get training, but I mean, that's that's the benefit of a domestic violence docket. We have seen the results from it, you know, the consistency and the collaboration. And I think we're now seeing the results of not having those dockets utilized because coming out of COVID, I think a lot of those dockets went away and we just never started them up again. Yeah. Or there's been resistance to starting them up. So, and, or, or it's impossible to, to fill like Kevin Right, Dunn. like Judge was saying, if you don't have the staff, this experience, I mean, I agree, you know, attrition has really hurt the division and judicial really bad. Yeah. And, so, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, you know, for us as a committee dealing with the standards, um, you know, a lot of that stuff is way outside of our, our purview and our control. Um, so, I, I mean, at, at least for, for us, I think the important thing is to get a prosecutor um, participant in this and, and just to kind of see what the landscape is. And honestly, we, I haven't spent a lot of time with prosecutors um, relative to all this, this type of an issue since, good Lord, five or six years. Um, so I really would love to hear you know, a sitting prosecutor 
tell us about kind of how the what happens in their landscape, albeit from one court. Um, obviously, we have Judge Doyle, who's you know obviously supportive of uh, a lot of that. Um, you know, well, he work. comes from that, so yeah, yeah. he does. Yeah, it's um, easy to support it when you come from it. And and maybe we just have to kind of get a landscape uh, picture. But anyway, you slice it for me. The knowing that the agency list isn't working, we have to come up with an alternative. And what, whatever that alternative is, it has to be functional and it has to be something that will be not, not embraced is probably the wrong word, but there's no reason to put something in place and just have it be not followed. Right. Because that doesn't help us either. Right. Um, no, you're right. John, so, be, sorry, Sean. No, go ahead. Yeah. I, I agree that maybe the DB docket is a little much to tackle in the subcommittee. We could certainly bring it to the larger council, but I am wondering if it might be worth expanding the focus of our group to discuss what programs are used, how they're used, when, maybe eligibility criteria, um, different programming that's available to folks that are incarcerated too, because I know that changes the game also in terms of convictions and dismissals and whatnot. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. I mean, I think we should also take a look at other systems too. And, you know, we got, you know, this really, what happens in other places. And I, I mean, obviously I'd love to hear what DCF is doing. I know they do, I think fathers for change. I could be wrong. I haven't really rounded back. We haven't had Mary Painter's probably been retired for 20 years. <laughs> Mary I Painter, that I don't remember her. She was on our committee. Yeah. yeah. And um, Linda, Linda, Linda from DCF. Um, oh yeah, Linda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Uh, I'm thinking too. Like, in addition to what Shauna was mentioning, uh, Joe, you had talked about what does what does a prosecutor go through, and I'm wondering. I mentioned at the beginning of this meeting that you know Gail or somebody from the state's attorney's office participating on the subcommittee, maybe they can do a presentation around what does a prosecutor go through in their analysis. Yeah. Um, you know, of cases, what you know, what what programs are they using? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking of it. And then like Shauna said, the criteria kind of getting into that piece too. So un being unable to solve all the ills of uh, today, <laughs> um, we have one other part is the FEP. And um, Shauna, do you want to take that or you want me to grab it? Um, yeah, I can start if you want to jump in. <laughs> but I think just expanding the focus of our discussions to talk about the eligibility criteria for FEP, um, namely charges or severity of cases for people who are first time offenders, but you know, are technically eligible for the family violence education program. So maybe trying to fill some of those gaps or talk about um, how we can address some of those issues for serious offenders albeit it's their first time in the court size. And again, I would love to have a prosecutor also talk about, you know, FEP, because, you know, obviously family relations counselors are, are recommending that for the vast, vast majority of the, the cases, right? Those are the cases that, you know, are eligible for referral to family services, and we're doing our analysis and we're putting people in the program. I think Merritt probably wants numbers on, on how many people go through the parenting ed program, um, and that, that I'm parenting at Jesus, uh, family violence. Wrong hat. <laughs> yeah, wrong hat today. Um, but that, that's, that's easy to do. Um, the, the, the difficulty though, in all our stats is COVID screwed them all up. So they don't look, you, you almost have to give too long of a, 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 like there's five years of pre COVID then COVID. And then now it's happening now because it just skewed everything dramatically. Um, are we still doing vi virtual groups or anything, Joe, or is that done now? Um, I think there are some availability um, for, for virtual, uh, but I think the vast majority are in person. Um, but I can get all that information. I don't oversee those programs anymore um, and haven't for about six years, so I can get all that information. Um, but yeah, not as many people go through it as, as the public seems to think. Um, and um, but we'll, we'll, we'll get you all that data. That'd be great. And at some point, maybe just a little bit of a, 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 a mini presentation on FEP and really what the, I did send to Shauna and Jerry the, the statute and the, um, 
the application and the victim notice, which I think the biggest part of the family violence education program is a victim does have the ability ability to object to participation, which um, doesn't happen for Explorer Bob, which right. um, only in that because the, the, the outcome is a dismissal of the charge. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what the what the the bigger committee or the what the idea was about family violence ed, what the what the beef was with it. Um, so I think just giving them uh, information about it and why it's in statute and how it's used probably is what they want. I mean, I, I'm not sure that, you know, there's all, and there's that piece where a judge with good standing can put pretty much anyone in the program. So there's a, there's that part of the application where right. a judge with good cause can, and it's usually for, you know, it's mostly most of the time in my, when I did the work, it was the risk of injury that was not yeah. really, really anything necessarily bad to a child it was you know domestic violence happened and the child, child was present was there um that would be the kind of thing that there was like a breach in a bat and then so um but i don't know how many times it's overridden i'm not even sure i could get that information i don't i don't i don't know yeah probably not I don't um, know. but i'm not sure what the, the the eligibility is you know you you have to you know the eligibility is pretty clearly spelled out um, so I'm not sure if people had a, a problem with the eligibility and wanted to change it or make it more rigorous. I don't know. I well, think it was more of how it, how it was then used, like those exceptions and multiple bites of the apple. Um, and I think that at some point in time, we did that analysis, like on, on average, how many times does someone get arrested before the FEP? We did it for Karen when she first came on, which is probably now a decade ago, <laughs> um, but if if my memory is is no, my memory stinks, but I remember that the most of the offenders that got the family violence education program in the first or second arrest, because at the time there was a lot of people saying you got arrested seventeen times or some outrageous number, and then you finally got the family violence education program, um, and I think that we did that analysis, and then we can we can replicate that. Well, and I think the biggest thing that the larger council needs to understand is FEEP is education, not treatment. Sure. It's not behavior modification, whereas no. Explore and Evolve are. So right. that's huge because if you're talking about changing behavior, you're not getting it with FEEP, not for a serious domestic violence offender. Right. And, and the idea is a serious domestic violence offender right. should Somebody be that's scared of the law and stuff, yeah. they're going to get it from education. But there's also times where I think, and this is probably where you see Explore being used pre-trial, as they do in lieu of. So they'll they'll grant the family violence education program, but the offender will do Explore as uh, in lieu of the nine-week program. Right, that but, happens. They're, that happens but they're getting a nolly or a dismissal from it. Yeah, you know, they're getting the treatment, right? I mean, they're getting the, they're right. actually getting a more robust treatment. And I mean, the reality is, is that when you look at people coming back one year after dismissal of the mm -hmm. FEP, it's very low, very, yeah. very low. I mean, it's not like we have 50% recidivism rates. I mean, it's like, it's been like 10% for the, my whole career. Yeah, yeah. And well, well, I'll give you all that information. I mean, it's really good information for them to have because, you know, you would think that, and I always explain this when, um, I give my presentations historically on FEP is that they're lower risk offenders, first or second time offenders, they shouldn't come back to court. I mean, they, they, they really shouldn't if, you know, the idea of, you know, an intervention, albeit education, um, a lot of what they're, they are teaching skills uh, within that program. Um, and you would think that those individuals wouldn't recidivate. Um, and, and that's been, and honestly, the outcomes for Explore and Evolve are equally good. You know, we just don't see a lot of recidivism after completion, um, but that's a, a different conversation, right? Because you can say, well, domestic violence could still be happening even though they don't get arrested again. Um, albeit that's the only measure that we have mm -hmm. in that. So, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's, I think, part of what Steve Cox wrote. And I'm not sure if I sent out, and I did, I sent, um, did I send the evaluation of FEP, Evolve and Explore? I don't think so. To you guys, I thought I did. Let me check. This afternoon. So one of the things that Steve Cox, in addition to the work he did with the DB standards, one of the reasons why we um, 
the grant was was he was selected. Oh, he was the only person yes. who did it. Yes. That, um, the Pew Foundation, which is kind of like this rigorous research based entity, wanted um, the domestic violence programs in twenty oh Jesus fourteen maybe um, to be studied. And every at the time, every single program that the state offered was going to go through this rigorous Pew Foundation. Um, thing. Well, the only thing that went through were my, were my family violence programs. Nothing else ever did. Um, but um, there was a researcher from from Pew that helped really kind of shape the study and um, and what participation meant. And it was really, really rigorous. And all three programs did very well. And I, I did send that. And you should take a look at that because that's pre-COVID um, and, and really... Um, Steve did a nice job um, with that research. Um, and, you know, when you look at um, evidence-based practice, you know, that's really what the, the standard is at the time is that Pew, um, that gold standard of research and um, explored to the best, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because FEP, obviously you wouldn't see much of an impact, right? They're first time offenders. You're not gonna see um, much. And evolve the highest risk. You're not going to see that big of a, an effect. Um, but explore, meaning that you're probably dealing with the middle-ish ground. Um, it did really well. Um, so that was great. That was awful, but it was great. It was awful to go through as the person who managed the program, but it was good. It was a good outcome. So, um, so I'm not sure. I think that you know. I think for us, the FEP is just probably. Um, information to the larger audience, um, and, and maybe when the legislators come on, um, and, and they'll they'll have more issues with FEP. I'm I'm just not sure. Anything else as we're coming up to the three o'clock hour? Well, that was a very healthy discussion. Thank you all. Um, in terms of next steps, I think um, Sean and I and, and Jerry will kind of regroup and um, kind of see what, uh, how we're going to kind of move this forward. And um, we'll have a, a, at least some sort of a structure in by next meeting. Is it worth discussing next meeting dates and times or are there not enough folks here you think to i mean i think that given that it's going to be the if it's just going to be the three of us or four of us that are going to be able to make it i think that we i think we should wait until potentially we get a state's attorney rep and then mm -hmm. maybe the session kind of gets to a point where um the rest of the i think the rest of the people are legislators am i wrong i'm public defender and, and legislators so and bill anselmo Right. Yeah. And we also yeah, talked about um, asking the larger the co-chairs of, of bringing on, you know, somebody like Steve Lanza, who has been a provider. Yeah. And, hmm. I mean, I it's not allowable under the under. The, I mean, I, I like Steve. He brings a lot to the table. He's a very thoughtful man and, and has a lot of experience. But I haven't literally talked to him in, in probably a year or two. So I'm just not sure where he's at. if he'd be. OK. How long, Joe, will it take Wanda, do you think, to finish her review of the document. She and I are meeting um, beginning of March, I think March 7th or 6th or 7th. I wanted to give her some time to kind of, she really needs to kind of absorb herself in it. She wasn't familiar with the standards. Um, and it's just a lot of cross-checking and trying to figure it out. So yeah, that, that work will probably be done um, by the time we have the next meeting. But Jerry, I think what I would do, and Shauna is, is I think ask the legislators like, you know what the what what would work for them and then maybe we would just then kind of be available when they are um i, I don't know especially during the session they're gonna it's gonna be a tight schedule for them mm -hmm. and, well, and maybe, right no i was gonna say i mean we could always send out a doodle and then mm. pull and then kind of figure out their response right yeah. there because I hate, I hate to just kind of go down this road and it really feels like we're reliving what we lived for 12 years or 13 years and right. just kind of go and then have somebody come back and not be involved in it and all of a sudden start throwing all these monkey wrenches in. And, and I, I'd rather not go down that road if I don't have to. I think it would be, I don't want to, I know our time is valuable and your time is valuable, but I really would love to hear 
the people external to the standards, what their ideas are on it. You know, we, we've lived it. You know, this is our, we've gone through this. So, so and, at some point, I remember um, there was going to be a reach out to the providers that were on our list. We did that. Yep, we did it. And, Natasha did it. Okay, was that included in her report? I don't remember. It was it was a survey that she um, did. I'll have to go back and find the results. Okay. Um, but I can't remember what the outcome was. She did, she I did it. I can't either. It was a document. I can't remember what it was. Okay, okay. I mean, it wasn't anything earth shattering, honestly. I think that they just don't get a lot of referrals. You know, right. it's the same. It was the same thing. I mean, it wasn't anything that was shocking to us. Right. Um, I think right. we accepted it, actually. Yeah. And, Unfortunately, a lot of the things we know to be true because we know them to be true. And we just kind of validate them through these things. Right. Um, right. <laughs> but at, at some point, you know, we got to figure it out. All right. All right. So maybe we'll send out a poll then to everyone to see. Just ask, I mean, maybe just the first step is just to ask them is like during session, are you going to be available at all yeah. to participate? And mm -hmm. if the answer is no, maybe we can add on after the the big meeting um, mm -hmm. or find time around that so that they're there and available mm -hmm. and already have maybe set some time off. Cause I know one of our subcommittees is before mm -hmm. um, the big meeting. And if maybe we could um, have it after just a thought um, mm -hmm. because really they're the only ones. I mean, I'm, I'm sure the public defender is, I'm not sure what that person's going to say. Mm -hmm. with you. I don't, I don't know of her anyway, but um you know, I think if we can get a prosecutor on and then see, see the, what the ledge, because I'd love to hear what they think. I mean, they signed up for this and, you know, do they even know what it, it, it is? And, you know, maybe they'll have some ideas on how to proceed. Joe, I'm just looking quickly at the, um, the council report, previous, the last council report. There was mention in there around um, developing a survey or conducting focus groups for prosecutors with the goal of expand. Well, it was with the goal of expanding the list, but I think given this conversation, it might be the other part of this sentence of um, regarding the utilization of approved provider list challenges, right on the local level, and then the review of other community providers that they're that are not on the list that they're currently using, um, not necessarily to build. The list yeah. as if we're going in another direction but kind of like again like you said the analysis of um it, maybe that makes a lot of sense and I, but um but that would be gail right and gail would yeah. be the person, so i don't have a problem doing a focus group that's easy that's that's and it, it might be very illuminating in terms of kind of what a prosecutor thinks relative to this because right. it would be almost interesting if they even know their standards yeah right yeah, especially going back to what Judge Doyle had mentioned about, you know, the turnover retirements mm -hmm. and right. All right. Anything else before we wrap up? Oh, thank everyone. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you all. Thank okay, you. Motion to adjourn. So moved. <laughs> so Shauna and uh, Jerry, I will, I'll see you probably within the next week or so. But um, if we want to kind of do a call later, not today, but just later in general, and we'll kind of come up with a game plan. Yeah. When's our next council meeting? The big council meeting is not going to be till the end of March. No, I don't think they set a date yet. Oh. Yeah, the other one was canceled for tomorrow, so. All right. So yeah, I mean, Megan was trying to connect with May to come up with another date. Are, are you on the other subcommittee? Who? Uh, Shauna and Jerry, are you guys on the other subcommittee, the one that is um, tomorrow? tomorrow? Yeah, I'm co-chairing it with Gail. Yes. So maybe maybe a few minutes uh, before or after, we can just kind of, we're, since we'll be together in the same space, we might as well use that time to just kind of... Are you joining virtually or in person? Um, because they're... It, I'm probably doing hybrid. virtual. It sounds like it's going to be a nightmare down there. Yeah, I'm virtual. I'm not going over the. Do you want me to go down there, Jerry? I'm not. A, I'm not a co-chair. I don't. Doesn't matter. Um, well, we had already we had reserved the room. Um, so actually, Gail and I are um, going to be going there. All right, I'll, I'll make my way there. 
that. Is Shauna going to have virtual or is Shauna going to be there? I can be there. I don't want to force you or anything, but I mean, we can. No, it's all right. Too late. Parking will be horrific. <laughs> yeah. Go to the <laughs> basement. Go to directly <laughs> to the basement. I can park at the court. I got to park at the court and walk over. So. Oh, yeah, you can. We're not all as special as you, Joe. <laughs> Obvious, Jerry. Obvious. <laughs> So, so I'll be there tomorrow. Good. All right. All right. Yeah, it's going to just be the three of us sitting there like a bunch of dopes. I mean, is that really what's going to happen? Yeah. Your laptop. Well, we're having a presentation. Oh, okay. But they're going to, I think that Karen is, uh, and uh, Lieutenant are. Um, they're virtual? <laughs> yeah. I'll be there just to support each other. <laughs> Maybe someone could buy me a cup of coffee for all the work I do. <laughs> I'll buy it. All right. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, All everyone. Right. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.